Well, very good morning to everybody listening. Welcome to Strong Australia's business webinar hosted by the Business Council of Australia and Townsville Enterprise. Uh, we've got a fantastic panel here for discussion. This is actually the first virtual Strong Australia function. And, uh, and so you can, we'll go for about half an hour chatting amongst the panel, and then please feel free to uh, ask questions of our panel. Um, you can just press the Q and A button there. My name is Tiki Fullerton, by the way, I'm the business editor at Sky News. Um, now, if you're not a member, um, I strongly amend, uh, recommend you, you sign up to uh, the Strong Australia Network. You can do that by going to online to www.strongaustralia.net. Um, but uh, anyway, let me um, uh, straight away introduce our panel, which you will be able to see at the moment. First off, Jennifer Westercott, who of course is Chief Executive of the BCA. Uh, she's been so since 2011. Uh, look, she's got a such a, many people, she's been, this is the third time in Townsville, I think, isn't it, Jennifer? Oh, okay. <laughs> Fourth, actually, um, and uh, and so many of you will be familiar to Jennifer. She spent uh, many years in both uh, the public and the private sector, New South Wales and Victoria. Senior partner at KPMG. She's on the board of West Farm. She chairs the uh, the Western Sydney uh, Area Tropics Authority in uh, in Sydney as well. Um, then to Trish O'Callaghan, Trish Wave. Um, Chief Executive of Townsville Enterprise. Now, Trish obviously drives the economic development for Townsville. Uh, she works in five local government areas, uh, Townsville, Charter Towers, Hinchinbrook, Burdekin, Palm Island. Uh, she was also the 2018 Boss Young Executive of the Year for, um, for, the, for the Fin Review, amongst other accolades. Uh, welcome, Trish. Marnie Baker. Marnie is the Managing Director of Bendigo and Adelaide Bank, has been since 2018. She's also Chair of the BCA's Regional Development Economic Working Group, and she's on a couple of other advisory boards for the, for the ABA, uh, which is the banking uh, main, uh, main body, and MasterCard Asia Pacific. Uh, then moving on to Mark Steinert. Uh, Mark, welcome there. Uh, Managing Director and Chief Executive of Stockland and uh, a, a big supporter of the BCA. Uh, you've been managing director since 2013, an extremely successful career at the top. You're just about to retire, uh, but you're not leaving for a, for, for a fair while, possibly until March next year. So very much uh, in the seat there. Senior roles, of course, through your career in property, but also at UBS where you uh, you're in charge of global asset management for UBS and, and research. So, and also the immediate past president of the Property Council. And then Brett Fletcher, Brett, give us a wave there. Uh, Brett is chief executive on the mining side, chief executive of Ravenswood Gold, 30 years in metals and, and mining in Australia, PNG, Laos. Um, just come, uh, come on board having been chief executive of Capricorn uh, Copper. We're going to hear a little bit more about Ravenswood today um, and was uh, noted the general, general manager for PNG operations at Newcrest. Uh, so welcome to you all. Jennifer, throwing to you first. Uh, look, uh, we've, as you've said, this is the fourth time uh, you've come to Townsville. What makes Townsville such a great candidate? Well, it's, it's just such an important part of Australia. It's a very diversified economy. It's a very rich economy. It's got an incredibly resilient population. It's got uh, organisations like Trisha's that have got these kind of quite uh, important plans. It's got, you know, whether it's mining, whether it's defence, whether it's tourism, whether it's agriculture, you know, this incredible diversification, I think, allows Townsville to come out of this crisis off the back of some pretty serious issues that the communities had to deal with. I mean, you know, last time I was up there in March, everyone was feeling so positive because the stadium had opened, 20,000 people had turned up to the Elton John concert, everyone was feeling optimistic, COVID strikes. The year before when we were up, the big floods had just been through, people were still kind of feeling uh, pretty um, down, but optimistic that the sort of essential ingredients are there. So to me, Tiki, uh, Townsville is a great story about why we're doing Strong Australia. How do we tap into what's important there, what we can grow on? How do we get some national focuses on places like Townsville so we can build the infrastructure, build the skills, and, uh, and a stronger Townsville is a stronger Australia, make no doubt about it. So, Jennifer, just, I mean, how significant is Townsville both statewide and nationally? 
Well, it's huge, obviously, in the state just because of its size, but it's incredibly important nationally because of its mining assets, its potential in agriculture, uh, its potential, I think, to play a bigger role in absorbing some population growth, which would, of course, have uh, a spin-on effect of creating more employment. It's got this quite strong defence capability, which could we can talk about, which could actually lead to many other jobs and many other industries. And, of course, it's very strategic positioned. And so, as a country, we take a, a stronger role in looking like at places like Townsville and saying, how do we make this community even more successful because that will have a big flow on effect for the rest of the country. Now, Trish, that obviously is your number one role. Um, just, just explain to me what the, the big opportunities are, what the big sectors are within Townsville and surrounds that you're working with. Yeah, and, um, and just to touch on some of Jan Jennifer's comments, um, you know, we do have an incredible community up here which has been dealing with crisis, not just this year, but for the past decade. So, as Jennifer mentioned, we came off the back of those unprecedented floods in 2019. Prior to that, we had that major mining economic downturn where we saw Queensland Nickel close their doors overnight and 800 jobs just disappeared. And then in parallel to all of that, we've been dealing with the drought. But through that, what's carried us through is this diversified economy that we have. So as part of our $16 billion worth of GRP, there's no one sector that represents more than 20% of that. So we do have a strong mining and resources sector, but that's very much complemented by agriculture. Our tourism sector puts over a billion dollars into the economy. Our advanced manufacturing, education, we have two universities here, so, and defence. Uh, you know, nearly 15,000 personnel and their families are based here, putting in over $1.5 billion into the economy annually. So, mm. so our Townsville City Council economists did acknowledge um, that you know, unlike like many other regions in this country, we've been hurt too by this crisis. And the figures that they were seeing was about $530 million potentially out of our economy from our tourism, hospitality and accommodation being essentially shut down up until now. But I think the opportunities are very much sitting with Australia's traditional industries that have been with the backbone. So mining, and I know we've got Brett online, um, has continued to employ through this. And you've got Ravenswood Gold, still progressing hard with their $600 million expansion. Adani's let $1 billion worth of contracts right up until now, and they're sitting across the street with a full office. Um, you know, our tourism industry continues to travel through even as restrictions lift. So, and advanced manufacturing, you know, with great, great, uh, great um, examples over the last few weeks with refineries and food producers now producing sanitizer, um, but also then major investment opportunities like city councils, calcium developments. I think, you know, the future is going to be bright here, but it's not without its stumbles. Yeah, well, you've got your, your job cut out for you, I'm sure. Uh, Brett, um, Trish mentioned mining there. Tell us about this $600 million opportunity. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm always happy to talk about our projects. So, look, we're located um, around about 180 kilometres sort of to the, to the southwest of Townsville. So I guess we would very much consider ourselves to be right in the, in the sweet spot of Townsville, but uh, very close to the township of Charters Towers as well and also include air. Oh, and, you know, so we've got a big, you know, a big community of people around us. Um, I guess I'm representing the sort of the new owners. I mean, we've only taken ownership of the projects on the 1st of April. So, you know, so pretty new. But And who are um, the owners? Um, so the new owners, so we're, we're a joint venture. So we're 50% owned by EMR Capital. So a large, um, you know, private equity business based in Melbourne. And, you know, this is EMR's fourth operation in Australia and the third in Queensland. So very very proud and, uh, you know, very keen, you know, company to continue to work with, you know, Queensland in particular for mining operations, along with Kestrel and Capricorn Copper. Um, and our other owner is actually a Singaporean listed entity uh, called Golden Energy Resources. Um, and so they've, you know, they've, they've joined up with EMR, I guess, to continue to, you know, to support the Australian mining industry. And uh, you know, both of the parents, I, I guess, have come in to this project on the basis of actually taking the expansion forward. So, you know, it's a, you know, Ravenswood is a brownfield site, uh, but now we're really looking to take that to the next level. What does that mean for jobs, Brett? Um, so, 
we're really looking at ramping up, restarting large scale open pit mining. So we're going to be looking for about 200 new employees in the next 12 to 18 months. Um, since we've started, I think we've put 40 on already. So we, we, we're making a fair dent into that already. So 40 new people at Ravenswood, but we've also set up the office here in Brisbane. You know, so probably, you know, 10 or 12 of us here in Brisbane as well. Um, and in the construction phase, uh, probably another 150 to 200 people involved in construction and really looking to set the mine up for the next, you know, we're looking at a 13 year mine life, but I mean, I guess in reality, we're setting it up for the, you know, for the decades to come because that's the, the belief that we've got in the potential of the area. Trish, I think you went on a, what, a 1,000 kilometre a road trip through the, the, the province. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, well, I think um, the message that we're putting to government at the moment uh, is that the North has untapped potential and we can really unlock the, uh, the potential here and play a huge part in the recovery of Australia if we can get some policy settings right and some investment in, into infrastructure. And I know the Northern Australia agenda is not new. It's been around for decades and decades, but now is the time to think differently and to showcase some of that potential. We went on that thousand kilometre journey. I'm a Mount Isa girl from, you know, by, by heart and, uh, and I'm from out there, so I know it well, but it's important for the country to see this province that sits on our back door, yard from Mount Isa to Townsville, is, it puts in from a resource perspective about $6 billion into the economy a year. It supports 20,000 jobs. But what's really exciting, Tiki, is there are $680 billion worth of commodities that are known tenements out there that are currently untapped. So I think for us, you know, if, if the wealth is there and it's requiring policy and infrastructure to unlock it, well, we have the answer to some of Australia's biggest questions right now when it comes to the economy. All right, I'm going to come back to those broad opportunities later. Mark Stein, if I can bring you in here. Uh, what is uh, Stockland's footprint in the Townsville area and what sort of window do you have on, say, small businesses at the moment? Yeah, uh, thanks, Tiki. So we've, um, we own Stockland Townsville with AMP Capital. It's a $366 million investment. And we have uh, Stockland uh, North Shore, which is a, um, ultimately a billion dollar project uh, with capacity for, for, for the 2000 homes. Um, so when we look at small business, um, that's a very important part of um, Stockland Townsville and also contributes to the buyer group uh, that we see for North Shore. And uh, as it relates to the, um, the asset itself, we've got 150 smaller stores in, in Stockton Townsville. Of course, retail has been hit very hard um, during COVID. And in fact, if you look at the data for Townsville, it's the, it's the segment of the economy that's seen the, the largest reduction with um, a lot of people going on to JobKeeper. And if you look at April and May, um, 55 to 60% of retailers were open and the balance were, were closed. Um, sitting here today, that we're now back at 100% open and, and foot traffic is almost um, back to where it was um, pre-COVID. So that's been good. And of course, Townsville's had a pretty low incidence uh, as it relates to, to COVID, nothing like the large cities. And I guess that's going to be the opportunity looking forward as you get some decentralisation into regional locations, as Jennifer mentioned, like Townsville, where you've got a great uh, infrastructure, great education, healthcare, and a lot of unutilised amenity, and, and that creates an opportunity. And we've seen with Home Builder, uh, which together with the state grant gives a first home by $45,000 in Queensland, and defence personnel get another ten to 15000 so you can buy a three-bedroom home in Stockland North Shore for three hundred and ten thousand dollars. So since Home Builder, we've seen a six uh, a six times uh, or six hundred percent increase in um, wow. first home buyer and, and new buyer activity off a very low base. Uh, bear in mind three that the levels of new housing were running at twenty-year lows, um, just reflecting fairly static population um, and employment. So. I would agree that um, with Trish that we're looking at a, at a brighter future for, for Townsville.
Yeah, well, really interesting what you said, Mark, about that. You, you, you know, the, the fact that Queensland uh, has come through this almost better than any other state at the moment. Like once again, today, zero, zero cases. Marnie, uh, you have a, a you know slightly different window through Bendigo and Adelaide and indeed Rural Bank, I think, as well. How do you see uh, people's situations at the moment in Townsville and, and going forward through the pandemic? Yeah, so Tiki, we have um, we have a, a good on the ground uh, knowledge when it comes to Queensland, and, and many people won't realise, but back in two thousand and one, uh, Bendigo Bank merged with First Australian Building Society up in Queensland, and we have um, great representation there, and even in Townsville itself, uh, there's three branches just in the in the close vicinity uh, in in Townsville. But I think it's, it's interesting um, listening, and I love the passion of Trish, because that's what you need. You absolutely need the, the passion and the, and the drive. Um, coming from a regional area myself, I can completely understand that, you know, um, there's a lot of similarities, not the weather, but a lot of similarities in other ways between Bendigo, um, you know, and the Townsville region itself. But I think you know, what we've seen, and I can even speak from an industry uh, perspective, and not only being on Adelaide Bank, but the banking industry itself, is that we're seeing um, two different speeds a little bit. You know, we've touched on a number of the sectors here, and, you know, in Brett and the mining sector, you know, it really has um, not felt the impacts that other sectors have sort of felt and has been sort of kicking on. But again, we talk about retail and things uh, and those type of sectors and, and tourism, especially, you know, up north and a reliance on, you know, having the international borders uh, open too, you know, that's it's had a, quite a profound impact. So from a customer perspective, and that's individuals with their, their mortgages and their home loans and small businesses, of course, you know, around the area up there, you know, we're seeing around 30% of borrowers um, which is higher than, you know, across the whole uh, of Australia, uh, who are seeking some form of assistance and whether that's some um, temporary assistance and it's a deferral of their, you know, their interest and, and principal payments on their loans or whether they're seeing something a, a little bit more permanent. But there is some people that are really hurting um, through this. Um, and, and, you know, we'll talk a lot about, uh, the positives and the resilience and, and that's what you will always see in a regional area and that's why I love living and working in, in a regional area. Um, we do also need to acknowledge that there are sectors uh, and there are people and businesses uh, that are going to find it tough to sort of come, uh, come through this and, yep. and, that, and, and we're dealing with that on a daily basis. Sure, I mean uh, obviously we're going to hear from the Treasurer next week, Jennifer, um, uh, clearly there, there are also opportunities to refinance mortgages now, which I think are at sort of record levels as well. But when it comes to, um, uh, you know, pushing back this cliff that everybody was so worried about in September, uh, there are hints now that both banks and the government are going to be much more nuanced, is the word, in uh, who they help and why. Uh, do you have concerns or, or hope about how this is going to be handled? I'm pretty hopeful, Tiki, because I think government's made it very clear that it's not going to just cut stuff off. The banks have made it very clear they're not just going to cut stuff off. And everyone is very uh, mindful that there are some sectors who just cannot reopen um, because, because of uh, health reasons. And so the government's made it extremely clear that it is going to taper it off, not cut it off, and, then, and, and redesign it effectively in terms of JobKeeper. And we're even seeing some sort of promising comments about job seeker, which, as you know, we've been long advocates that the new start allowance is, in, is inadequate. I think the big challenge, though, is that's a very important conversation to have. But the big conversation is how you create what I what I calculate to be about two million jobs. So if you assume there's 3.3 million people on job keeper, there's 1.4 million people on job seeker. Let's just assume. Uh, albeit uh, not a great thing, that some of those people on job keeper will not get their jobs back. There will be you know, an inability for those people to go back to work. So let's just say for argument's sake, there's too many jobs to create. That requires a different policy focus. And some of that policy focus is the conversation we're having today. We have got to back some places across the country 
to, to take more population, to grow their industries, to grow their exports, to uh, build on their comparative advantages, because just a little bit of tinkering is not going to do the task of creating 2 million extra jobs. And we've got to create those in two years yeah. to, create, to create them before. So, so Trish, uh, obviously one of the great opportunities uh, for, for Townsville is that 320 days a year of sunshine. Um, now we've seen uh, flights such as Graham Turner out today saying we've got to keep the borders open. Uh, where do you see the frustrations uh, for uh, your tourism sector up there? What, what's the news on the ground? Yeah. So um, when we were at full restrictions, our economy was losing about $90 million a week. We support about 7,000 people uh, in our tourism industry and, and it was really hurting and essentially shut down. I've got to acknowledge the Premier and the government, the way we've managed this health crisis is allowing the restrictions to ease up here. So the Queenslanders back in Queenslanders, when we were able to open up interest state, uh, did have a really positive impact on our, our, on our industry up here and our school holidays at the moment um, and we're just coming off the back of them. The reports are that we had a solid school holidays, albeit uh, those restrictions still do limit some of the commercial opportunities uh, that, that uh, we could take advantage of. But I think what we're looking at is that we don't necessarily want to have the same industry that we had going into this crisis the way um, when we come out of it. And, and when I say that, I mean, well, now's the opportunity to uh, look at the new product that was in the pipeline. So we spoke about the Queensland Country Bank Stadium. Uh, we've had one event in that. It was a full house, the Cowboys opening um, the stadium, as well as Elton John. But again, that, that event's economy is going to be important and it's great to see on the front page today, Jeff Horn confirming his fight here on August 26th. Um, on top of that, we've got new products like the Museum of Underwater Art where we will be able to share our great barrier reef stories. So that's a fantastic yeah. museum, literally under the water, ready to go now, which we are getting ready to launch, which we want people to come and visit. So the interstate borders are opening, albeit Victoria is still shut down. They're coming across the border. They're coming into the city. Uh, we still have some constraints around restrictions, but we're making the most of it. And are you hopeful? I mean, there was what was some suggestion that there's a bit of confusion on businesses front between you know your smaller enterprises and the larger ones. The four four uh, meter squared rule is sort of uh, not applicable, I think, still for larger ones. Are you hopeful that will be lifted? We're most definitely, and, and how the health pandemic is managed in parallel um, will be really key to that. But, you know, we're saying that, and I know prior to the two ADF personnel that were just recently diagnosed that are not quarantining in Townsville, we had nearly 100 days without a case up here. So, you know, so I think that's good news for us, but um, we're not, we've got to be cautious. We know that safety has to be paramount, but we do see if, if we can open and lift those restrictions further here, you can have parts of the Australian economy doing some of the heavy lifting of those jobs that Jennifer's saying that may never come back and exist. So um, we're looking at this in a collaborative approach. I know the council's put together Task Force NQ, which is partnering government and business with industry to look at a way and a pathway forward. Um, and some of these new opportunities that I've just spoken about are part of that. And let's not forget about aviation because we work, we have an international airport that uh, had, hadn't had an international flight for some time. But um, we see huge opportunities to open up that Trans-Tasman bubble with New Zealand to come into Townsville. And yeah. let's not forget about Singapore as well. Right. Mark, where do you see the real sort of engines of, of, of growth? Um, tourism, yes, but others which presumably drive uh, your two business areas in the Townsville region. Yeah, well, I guess if we start with uh, housing construction itself, every dollar spent as a three times economic multiplier. So that will actually create jobs uh, pretty much immediately as uh, we start to. Multiplier. Yeah, you know, well, that's that's a direct multiplier. I mean, indirectly, it's even greater than that. Um, housing is one of the fastest um, segments to contribute to, to economic growth. But I think um, more broadly, you know, it's interesting. There's obviously a, a massive uh, mining base uh, in the region that was talked about. But the rail line that connects that to the port um, is substandard and should be able to accommodate, uh, you know, 80 kilometre an hour trains and can only run at 38 as an average. And 
as I'm sure you know Brett can speak to it, but there's many areas where it doesn't even get close to that. So that's got to be a place where the government could look at fiscal stimulus and upgrade that line. There's also, I think, one of the largest um, copper string, which is uh, you know wind and solar and battery. Um, so one of the largest uh, sustainable installations uh, in in the southern hemisphere. Uh, that has a lot of capacity, and of course, uh, within the with the region, there is scope for manufacturing. And we know there's this dependency on energy. I'm sure Jennifer can speak to it um, in much more detail. But that that's a you know an easy area to to stimulate, um, bringing forward the fast tracking of planning approval, so that mines and and that mineral resource can be opened up to create jobs. And it's all about jobs at the end of the day. Yeah. And of course, the the TAFEs and the universities need to look at micro credentialing. Another one of Jennifer's favourites, and how do we actually equip um, the the young people in Townsville as well as the nation for the jobs of the future? And of course, there's a lot, there's a great healthcare um, you know set of facilities in in Townsville, and we know we've got an ageing demographic. Although Townsville's got a pretty young population, yeah. actually. But it can play this role together with defence. I mean, you've got a commitment, I think, with the Singapore Army to come and, and train and bring 25,000 uh, soldiers a year uh, into Townsville for six months. Um, there's a large upgrading of the barracks to accommodate that. So that's going to drive jobs as well. And, of course, we've got this new commitment to uh, to the north of Australia and our defence into the future. And it's, I would imagine that Townsville plays a very important role in that. Well, well, indeed, and you just look at what the ADF are being used for at the moment through COVID as well. Um, Brett, uh, Mark raised the issue of the infrastructure in mining, and with that, that you've got the you've got the rail link there that needs work. What are the uh, real pressure points for you and for mining in the in the region? Well, yeah, the goal would completely agree with Mark, and I think he's you know he's raised two incredibly important opportunities there. One is obviously the rail line, which links the Townsville port to the Mount Isaac on Curry district, um, but also links you know everything in between, then in that thousand kilometre long stretch. So you've got a basically a single access way that can be significantly impacted in wet weather. Um, it really is probably one of the most valuable assets in the whole of Australia. Um, and so to have that asset not operating efficiently is, you know, you know, is a great detriment to all of us. But equally, the copper string, which is really, you know, the equivalent of that rail line, but in an electrical form, which would connect Mount Isa to the grid, <clears throat> um, would open up not only Mount Isa and Concurry and fundamentally halve the power prices of those operations, but give access to every town and every potential project and many of them would be renewable projects you've got great solar potential great wind potential in that thousand kilometer stretch really start to link everything together now uh, I think mining companies and you know many large companies have always been keen to share the burden of infrastructure I mean most mining companies you know we build our own roads you know we set up our own airports you know we you know we know that we have to contribute to that but when you have projects of this you know, state significant scale or even national scale, you really do need somebody, you know, somebody championing that at a government level, whether that be state or federal, but someone's got to get in behind it and say, you know, we're going to do this. And, you know, and I think that's the sort of the leadership we're looking for. We're looking for people to step up to the mark and say, look, you know, this copper string, it's been around for 20 years, we're going to do it. And then I think you'll find, you know, once you see that commitment, that people will get on board. I mean, you know, there are so many potential upsides and you can build something. I mean, I'm not sure when the Mount Isa rail line was built, probably in the 40s or 50s. You know, what that has contributed back to the state and the country in that period would be uncalculatable. Um, and so, you know, it's just that foresight. It's around water, it's about roads, it's about power and it's about infrastructure. But I think it's probably even more important is, you know, is policy. And you know, and the commitment by government to you know to make these projects happen. Yeah. I mean, the greatest, yep. the greatest challenge we have is uncertainty around permitting. Around burn, yes. Talk a bit more about that for us, Will. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, there are uh, you know a lot of investors, you know, in Australia, and the, but there's a lot of investors globally that want to invest in Australian projects. 
now for them to do that, um, they want to, you know, they want some certainty that the project can proceed. <clears throat> you know, so they're looking for, you know, the ability to get a project permitted, and you know, per permitting a project in Queensland, you know, is a long process. You know, from scratch to when you can start, you're talking probably five to ten years to convert an exploration lease to a mining lease is would take you two years minimum. You can do that in Western Australia in six months. Yeah. So someone well, that comes along and says, look, I want to convert this and start mining, you know, it's really, well, you know, you're going to have to wait two years before you can get that done. And that just it's not going to cut it for a lot of investors. Yeah, well, I noticed Jennifer nodding furiously there, but let me pull in Marnie from, uh, again for a moment. Marnie, on the, uh, on the ground, both in terms of small businesses and ordinary people with houses now, I mean, what do you think they should be thinking about their own risk? Uh, people talk about the potential, but it must be an everyday conversation around the dinner table about decisions they should all be making. Uh, going forward at the moment. Yeah, just before I go to that, Tiki, I think just, you know, adding on so, sort of from Brett there, we're not short of projects. And, you know, and Jennifer, I know, you know, it's working hard and that's what the BCA is, is working with government around how we actually just release a lot of this red tape that's there and just be able to free up and, and to be able to accelerate a lot of the projects and the investment that actually is required um, in in regional areas, because you know, going back to what Trish said before, um, the regional areas and somewhere like you know, like Townsville and and, and the Townsville region and, and and North Queensland has a huge opportunity uh, to really unlock a lot of economic activity, and that's what the government is after. That's the way that we're actually going to to build and and recover out of. Uh, out of COVID um, and it's going to take some years to do that and we should be actually starting now and and you know investing in those sort of um, those sort of projects so whatever we can do and you know and this is what the BCA is about too is being being a voice uh, into government on behalf of uh, of businesses small medium and large um, you know, if you have those type of examples of where things are actually being held up or where red tape is getting in the way, um, you know, feed but from your own experience, from your own experience, Marnie, at the moment, whether it's down in Victoria or wherever it is, are you seeing that you know some policymakers, government leaders are 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 accepting that this is a burning platform and therefore. Yeah. We, we need to be making decisions faster and looking at these sorts of issues. Are you getting that positive feedback? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, it, the, the silver lining, I think, to come out of what, is, you know, has been a really tough, um, you know, last five months uh, is the fact that we've actually seen um, both sides of government and state base come together. And the Cabinet's been a, a fantastic Thing to actually bring bring the states together, and all of a sudden we're actually working on the the things that we should be, and focusing on the things that we should be. We should be taking advantage of that now. And and again, this is what the the BCA is focused on. It's what the working groups are, are focused on within the BCA. Is how do we actually use that now to cut through some of the things that actually have stood in the way of businesses being able to grow and flourish. So, you know, I think there's huge optimism um, that we actually can do that and everything. And Jennifer, you can, you pipe in here, because um, I know you're very passionate about this, you know, on behalf of your members too, but we're getting all of the right uh, conversations and the doors opened and, um, and an optimism that we actually can. But we have to be really um, uh, particular. We have to give, give real examples. Um, hand it to government on a platter and say, this is the exact piece of legislation or this is the exact thing that actually needs to change mm. because, because otherwise we can't leave it to them to sort of figure that out because they're running so hard. So we need to sort of hand it to government and say, this is the thing that needs to change. And if you change this, this is the impact that it's going to have on the economy. Yeah, well, Brett certainly has some specific examples. Jennifer, yeah. want to jump in there? Yeah, sure. Look, I think, I think governments have been magnificent throughout this. I mean... Mm. You know, I think as Australians, we've been very well served, whether it's, you know, at a state level, at a federal level. You know, I, I don't think there's a single government that's not focused on how do we get our projects uh, out of the planning system. Uh, I think what has happened here, Tiki, is that 
the realization of just how much, to Brett's point, how much regulation was holding us back, how much stuff companies in small or large had to go through to get something done. But now we've got to stay the course. We've got to stay the course with these bits of regulation that have been put on hold for a minute so that people can just keep people in work. But yes. now they say, well, actually, let's fix that. So, you know, my plea all the time is if we got rid of it for this crisis, why would you put it back? You know, why would we re replace restrictive trading hours? Why would we go back to a system where it takes five years to get a project up? Because around the world, people are having the conversations we're having today. How do we tap into new markets? How do we get projects going? How do we get people back to work? So whilst Marnie's right, there's a lot of money around, there's also a lot of competition for it. And we need to make ourselves as, as Australia and then places like Townsville, great places to invest. So one of the things I'd love to see in communities like Townsville is things like a 30 year infrastructure plan where government says, here's the compact, if you will, that we're going to commit to over the next 30 years. And, you know, it's, it's then people can plan. Brett can say, well, okay, we can fund this bit. Uh, we can fund this bit. Mark can say, well, we can fund that. Um, government is gonna have to release its balance sheet, which is pretty healthy. Uh, to say, well, we're going to have to kind of do some of this public infrastructure so that we can get things going. And the, uh, the the rail line that people are talking about is an obvious one. And then we've got it, we've just got to try and make it easier to do business. And I think the point that I want to make on that is that we often confuse degree of difficulty with somehow better outcomes. Absolutely nothing could be further from the truth. The more complex, the more double handling, the more people involved actually reduces transparency and reduces the quality of decision making because everyone thinks somebody else is doing something. So now is the time, I reckon, for the country to just grab hold of the levers and pull them as hard as we can and don't just do that in Melbourne and Sydney. Oh, and it's, and it's uh, sorry, to you, and it's really important that. The, the, the voice is actually coming from those people that are on the ground that understand their regions or their communities the best. Um, it's really important that that voice is in there because you can't let people sitting, um, you know, in an office somewhere make some decisions about your particular region. You know what's best. Yeah, yeah. Um, look, if, speaking of voices, if, if anybody has a question, question, feel free to uh, throw it onto the Q&A uh, button and, uh, and press away. Um, panels here, uh, any subject that, uh, that, that you feel is, um, is, uh, has been underdone so far, uh, but I might actually pull back in Trish to, to talk about some of the sort of infrastructure and other major um, investment that you would like to see to kickstart as, as someone who is a Townsville girl now. Yeah. Um, uh, very much so, and um, and you know it is about growing population in the regions, and I know that's a that's a challenge for um, regions everywhere in Australia. But I think now is our window, and we do need infrastructure investment to do it. And I just want to give you some of the examples to show the fundamental issues that we're having with infrastructure here. When you talk about this, you know, six billion dollar Northwest Minerals Province, and you've got six hundred and eighty billion dollars worth of commodities in the ground, but it's cheaper to put trucks on the road rather than put them on the one rail line that takes it from Mount Isa to Townsville, you've got a problem. I think when you've got a billion dollar renewable energy project just on our back door, doorstep near Hewenden on hold because they can't have access to the national electricity market and affordable energy, you have a problem. And I think when you've got, you've been dealing with nearly a decade of drought, yet when we had those unprecedented floods last year, you had thousands of megalitres of water flowing into the Coral Sea and not captured to get us ready for the next decade, you have a fundamental problem. So mm -hmm. I think this is where we're saying to what Marnie's saying, is these voices have always been here, but we now need to, through what Jennifer's trying to do, is put them on the national stage to say, we can do the heavy lifting for Australia, not because we have to, because we want to, and there are opportunities here. So let's fix the Mount Isa to Townsville rail line and look at it differently instead of looking at it as cost recovery. Let's build Hell's Gates Dam and open up 50,000 hectares of irrigated ag, which is currently doing nothing up here. Let's find a way to turbocharge our tourism industry when you've got such access 
you know, globally here uh, with some new products. Um, and let's look at Copper Stream, a renewable, uh, a transmission line that will not just help the mining industry now, but turbocharge advanced manufacturing and, and mining and resources. So, you know, through Task Force Game Q, we've got a list of projects and priorities as well. You know, we've, we're sticking to them, they're consistent, but now's the time for governments at both federal and state to think differently about this area and how they can help the state and national economies if they can get some of these policy settings right. right. And, just, and, just, and just to debunk a myth too, from a population perspective, the Regional Australia Institute actually uh, produced um, a, a report just recently and um, it actually showed that it was a, a net inflow of migration into regional areas away from the, away from the cities. Uh, and that's based on the last census data. Mm. Marnie, um, you know, in terms of regional development, what are your hopes for the Liveris review around energy and, and trying to get some cheap energy, um, which the government is considering at the moment? Yeah, well, I mean, energy is not my, um, my, my expertise, except to say that all businesses actually rely on, um, you know, the, the cost of energy. And it has been an increasing cost across, across all industries. And something, if we talk about inhibitors uh, to businesses, energy, transport, those sort of infrastructure, mm. um, telecommunications, you know, is another one. You require really good infrastructure to be able to run your businesses and you know there's a fair amount of work and part of the stuff we're doing around the with the regional working group um, is looking at energy as well and I think there's a specific working group Jennifer isn't there just specifically on energy because it is so important yeah. uh, to all businesses and the operation of all businesses. Indeed. Um, Mark, I'm sure you, you've got half an eye on this, uh, both the Treasurer coming out next week with his, it's almost a mini budget, one would, uh, well, one's expecting, yeah. um, but also uh, presumably some reflection on the work of the, the COVID, uh, the Corona Commission Task Force and, and that Liveris review on energy. Yeah, well, of course, energy uh, is a big input for uh, town centres and uh, across our asset base and uh, as was mentioned it has been something together with um, local government taxes that's been consistently rising um, and uh, the uh, while we've we're a leader in sustainability and we've been uh, we're some of, we have the largest uh, rooftop installation of solar um, in the southern hemisphere or one of the largest and we want to uh, add more um, the points that were made by Trish about how do you tap into the grid and how do you um, deal in front of the meter um, sensibly uh, really does require a far more coordinated approach to energy where you know you can actually emo can look at everything that is being produced and balance load and then look at where storage um, can be added and things like copper string which does incorporate storage as well as production Mm -hmm. um, becomes such a logical piece of it because ultimately, you know, whether it's snowy hydro or it's uh, it's gas-fired, um, you know, boosters or it's it's battery, um, you do need to be able to store for the times when the obviously the renewable energy sources are not available, and and you do need to be able to use energy sources like gas for that. And uh, we're certainly big advocates for creating a more efficient. Um, energy market and that, that of course feeds into manufacturing and with the concept of advanced manufacturing and, and reshoring which is something that everyone's talking about now as a result of COVID where quite frankly a lot of the jobs that have been taken um, offshore for call centres and for accounting services will come back um, in, and probably will go into regions and into smaller cities because they're, they're cheaper and they have highly skilled, um, you know, labour forces available for that. And of course, you know, we've learnt through the crisis or we've learnt so far that Australia only has five or six days of fuel supply and 90% of all medication is made offshore. So you're going to see a lot of um, advanced manufacturing and manufacturing that will come back to Australia, I suspect, because you have to have continuity of supply chain. Mm -hmm. and you have to create more integrity in the supply chain. And that, of course, takes energy and it takes people. Yeah. Jennifer, uh, to what extent do you think that uh, a, a different 
approach to energy, which could include, we hear, pipelines across the north, uh, could actually help open up the north, develop the north. Well, it's, it's one thing that we absolutely have to uh, have on, on the table for consideration. Uh, I think, you know, in the sort of shorter term, there are some other things to do, you know, my views about the moratoriums on gas. I think people keep forgetting how important gas is going to be, how important it is as a firming technology to make sure that we both reduce our emissions and uh, get uh, reliable supply and affordable supply. And this is why, you know, the reports that the government has released recently are so important, particularly the technology roadmap, because that signals to investors, well, this is where the kind of main opportunities are going to be. Uh, this is one area, and we've got quite a lot of focus on it, uh, as Marnie said, in the Business Council. Uh, this is one area where the country ought to take this opportunity to get energy and climate change settings right, because if we leave them unsolved, uh, then uh, we won't get some of the investment that people are talking about today. Now, let me come back to Brett because this yeah, talk about red. There's three questions there. If I just have a look. Well, Jennifer, I think you could probably see them. I, I can't. Um, so if you want to fire one up, please do. Well, it's actually, um, uh, actually uh, one to, um, to Brett, actually. Yes. So you going to Brett um, and about the red tape reduction that would actually help the mining sector. Yes. Yeah. Well, look, I, I think, um, you know, <clears throat> I guess it's a complex question, but I, I guess in its simplest terms, Ravenswood Gold, where I, you know, currently work and also Capricorn Copper, are actually both projects of gazetted state significance. And so we've actually had the benefit of you know, being able to work with the Department of the Coordinator General. And to be quite honest, I'm not sure how we would have progressed either of the projects as rapidly as we have without that assistance. Um, I mean, you know, mining projects, I guess, by their nature are complex. So we deal with, you know, the Department of Mines, the Department of Agriculture, we deal with forestry, we deal with the Department of Education and Health, and there are, you know, main roads. There's just a myriad of <clears throat> individual state government departments and also federal government departments and each part of it is an integral cog in actually getting the whole project permitted. Um, yeah, I guess in simplistic terms I think more coordination, more support and advocate in government is absolutely critical. Um, I mean the Department of the Coordinator General to be fair have been a fantastic advocate for our current project. Um, you know we're talking with them every second or third day and that's the level of involvement that's been necessary if we really want to take our project forward. And I would suggest many other projects need that, need that advocate that's actually supporting and helping. I mean, we're happy to, to, you know, to follow any guideline, rule, regulation, do whatever it takes. But you have to know what it is and you want some certainty around the fact that if you do the right thing, the project will be able to, to advance on the timeline that you've committed you've committed to. And that's really what the investors are looking for. They want, an, they want some certainty. Um, and we need to look at ways of, you know, of cutting through the red tape and also the enormous amount of green tape as well. And that's you know, not being cheeky about that. That's just saying, you know, we want to do the right thing. We just need some certainty to know what we need to do. Yeah, so obviously mining is really important. Um, Trish and, and anybody on the panel, what are the, the, the best areas for creating job, it's jobs in the region, do you think? Trish first. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, resources is, is key and uh, touching on what Mark was saying, it's not just looking at uh, the current mining, it's not just looking at, uh, you know, even agriculture, it's looking at the, the spin-offs, the advanced manufacturing, which, you know, there is a turn back to self-reliance and I think the North can play a huge role in that. I think agriculture is really important, but we need water for that, um, but we've got uh, arable land up here that we would love to develop and grow and, and export, so I think really important. Um, defence and tourism um, are also key, but I think coming to, uh, you know, our passion of Jennifer's is, uh, is around that education and if we're going to get our generations ready for these new jobs, uh, you know, STEM is so important and JCU at one of our last events uh, just before Christmas put out a, a study that showed STEM subjects and, and all our regional children up here in North 
going into tertiary studies was basically falling off the cliff. Yet if you look at the opportunities in these new industries and new economies, there's so much potential. So I think, you know, education and health will play a really big role in our future. And let's not forget visitors, you know, the background behind me is our winter evening up here. It is a stunning 20 degrees. We have beautiful mornings and lots of open air and space. So no problem social distancing up here for those that want to come and visit. And you're, and you're rubbing it in to a Victorian, <laughs> Trish. Um, uh, Tiki, I, you know, I think also corporate Australia should be looking at it, you know, as we're, as a, a lot of organisations are looking to onshore, given given the, the the months that we've been through and now everyone are re-evaluating their businesses that onshoring and those sort of roles looking at regional australia looking at places like townsville to actually put um operations the fact that we actually don't have to um you know physically work in a in an area now either you can be employing people wherever um you know think about employing people in the in the regional areas think about how you can actually have an operations that's actually out of the Townsville region. I think that's a message to corporate Australia too. We'd love every national company to be reconsidering their strategies and looking at the likes of here at home. I know the mayor here is quite passionate about uh, and, and I can tell you we've got 162 years of that working in regional areas. So yeah. it works. Yeah. Mark, do you want to join in? Yeah, well I'd certainly agree with the um, the reshoring. That's a that's an easy opportunity and when you can but it's going to take some coordination because some of the the staff that are offshored um, particularly the the more senior managers probably need a pathway to residency in Australia or at least a working visa um, and they and they would need obviously a couple of weeks of quarantine but we've seen in a number of states that we can quarantine successfully and and that's probably worth you know two three four thousand jobs getting tourism going and we know there's a net that Australia has a net deficit in tourism and Australians spend 20 odd billion a year overseas on tourism we're not going to be traveling overseas anytime soon so working out how to cross promote the nation and how to think about um, some of the great holidays that people can have with their families in Australia and places like Townsville and far north Queensland are obviously um, front and center for that and that leads directly into food and beverage and retail. Um, if we reinstated the food and beverage and retail employment in Townsville, uh, where it was uh, only four months ago, that's another 3,000 jobs. Wow. And of course, if you moved housing construction back to the long-term average, that's another 3,000 jobs. And then if you put the, if you put the rail line in, uh, upgrade the rail line and you do the copper string, that's at least another 3,000 jobs. So you add all that up, um, you're talking about a 20% increase in employment in Townsville. Yeah. yeah, and Jennifer, let's go back to defence as an opportunity because, I mean, it's got such a massive footprint, hasn't it, defence in Townsville, both the RAAF and the ADF. What are the opportunities there, do you think? Well, there are massive opportunities, Tiki. I mean, you look at the uh, spend that government's going to put into defence, and you, I think there's a few the last time we were there that I thought really needed sort of, um, government to say we're going to make Townsville the centre for training, uh, particularly simulated training. And so when we talked to people uh, on the ground last time we were there, this was a huge opportunity and this opportunity to train uh, in conjunction with the Singaporeans. But this is the sort of stuff we need across the country is to sort of say, look, you know, here's something we can build on in a place like Townsville where you've got a very big base You've got a lot of capacity, a lot of skill, got an excellent university. Mm. Let's make this the training centre for defence personnel, particularly as we start thinking about this huge uh, and, and, in my view, very correct spend that the government has forecast last week. Let's see how we can actually grow other industries in locations like Townsville so that we can get a real maximum uplift uh, because, you know, I think, you know, there's so much uh, to build on there. Mm. Yeah, and you just drilling down there on, on the skills front, there's defence, you mentioned the university there. In terms of value-add, high-tech skills, yep. I mean, it must be a wonderful quality of life up there as well. I mean, what are the, would the opportunities be there? Oh, huge, huge. I mean, this is, you know, my passion that we've got to break down the long path that people take to get skilled. 
And we've got to look at these micro credentials and we've got to look at them in the areas where employers want to kind of have people. So for example, if we're serious about getting data centers back, call centers back, we need to be offering micro credentials in data analytics, data processing, and that's got to be done in conjunction with companies. Mm -hmm. We've got to invest in those, uh, in those curriculum. Now, whether that's developed at TAFE or as micro credentials at universities, you know, that's what we've got to do. You know, think about all of the kind of um, ancillary training that you would do off running a defence training initiative on a, on a global scale in Townsville. Think of all the micro credentials. Right. And, then, and then I think there's a big task for the economy, Tiki, in helping people get back to work. There'll be some people who do not have the right digital skills. They will not have them. So many people who've been working in bits of retail, or they will not have them. And we need to fast track their capacity to upskill in the digital space. But, but don't ask people to go into a three year computer science degree. Ask them to do a very targeted micro credential in digital capability or robotics or artificial intelligence, depending on what kind of industry they're in. We've got to unleash this across the economy so that people can get skilled really fast. But saying to people, you know, who've just lost their jobs or who are at risk of losing their jobs or who are underemployed, which is the point the Treasurer made yesterday, our recipe for you is a three year degree. It's not going to happen. Yeah. So um, perhaps I could ask the panel, anybody jump in who feels they want to take this one from Richard Holiday. Um, with coal fired generation being phased out and Cal IB power station closing in a few short years, how can North Queensland build a decentralised region on renewables without the availability of scalable gas fired electricity generation when the sun and wind power is unavailable? I mean, maybe Trish, you could kick off with that one. Yeah. And it is an old adage and there's a lot of discussion and debate around this. Um, but I think the, the fundamental of this is North Queensland needs affordable and reliable power. So I think that's really clear. Um, our position has always been that will be a mix um, and it has been the case up here. And even with that mix, we still don't have affordable energy. So our small businesses are saying their, their electricity prices are too high. We still have pensioners at home that aren't turning their lights on because they want to save on energy costs. And you've got a Northwest Minerals province, which is one of the only major industrialised precinct that is not connected to the national energy market and has skyrocketing prices for energy. So I think, you know, for us, we will have coal, but we obviously need to unlock the renewable energy and, and gas is going to be an important part of our fabric as well. So I think I, I, we acknowledge the Prime Minister and the Federal Government, they've done a fair bit of work there. Um, as Jennifer said, they have a technology roadmap, um, but I think it, it hasn't been addressed today. We don't have a full solution yet, but it surely will be a transition. Marnie, if I could come back to you for that question I asked you earlier, because we're almost out of time, about you know, what your message to your customers, indeed all um, Townsville folk uh, business and, and people who've got uh, loans or mortgages, um, how should they be looking at, at the immediate future in, in Townsville? Yeah, look, I think there's huge opportunity in Townsville and we've just spoken about it. I mean, that's, you know, a lot of the conversation that we've had here. But if I go back to individual circumstances and where I started at the start saying that people will be in different situations, um, you know, I would say to those that actually do need some assistance through this period of time to be talking to their bank. Um, to, you know, it, it is now, and, and, and um, Jennifer referred to it uh, earlier when we were talking about the discussions with, the, with, with government and what the banks were doing to support customers. What we are looking at now is being really tailored. So this is, you know, come and see your bank and we will talk about your specific circumstances rather than an overarching package. And, and that's what we're here to do. So to please do that. But in a, in, in a general sense, you know, what we need here, and I know there's, um, you know, there's uncertainty and I know that, that that affects confidence, but we need spending. We need confidence levels to be up and we need people to be spending because that will create the activity, that will create the, the, the way that we actually do recover and move past this period of, uh, of, um, of economic uncertainty. So I, I know that's a hard thing to say. And if you're not certain about whether you've got a job you know, in the future, now or in the future, that's a hard thing to say, but it really is spending is actually going to investment and spending is going to get us out of this. Brett, so, you, are in, Brett you are investing and spending. Uh, are you going to be uh, hiring a lot of locals, do you think? 
mean, our intention is to hire 100% locals. Mm. So, I mean, at the moment, of the 200 people we've got, I think all bar one come from the direct region. So, you know, it's absolutely our intention to get as many people from Ravenswood, Charters Towers, Townsville, Bowen Air, um, and, you know, and why wouldn't you want those people? I mean, Townsville has got a fantastic uh, skills base. Um, you know, it has got everything going for it. Um, you know, it's got pretty good infrastructure. I mean, it really just needs that determination and will, um, you know, and the place can just, you know, having lived there for three years myself, a few, a decade ago, I, I know there's massive potential there and I know that's why it attracts a lot of people. And, you know, as far as subcontractors go as well, I mean, we're about to award a $15 million uh, man of steel manufacturing project to a local Townsville steel manufacturer. Um, we're hoping to buy $90 million worth of mining fleet from the local dealer. Um, you know, these are not insignificant things. And I mean, a lot of businesses will be attracted to Townsville because it provides that skills base. And it, it has also got so many engineering facilities available to it. It's, it's um, you know, it, it's absolutely a fantastic place to be a miner, to be quite honest. We, well, we, did, we did some research, Tiki. Uh, just around uh, customers, um, you know, the customers of our organisation and three out of five said that they'd actually increase their spending with local business. Mm -hmm. Well, look, it's I great think, to see that. I think it's great to see and I think that's a great note to end on. Uh, I'd like to thank our panel very much indeed uh, for, for joining us and Townsville does look like it's just sort of brimming with, with opportunity and we all want to go there anyway right now. So thank you to our panel and all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Tiggy.